I'm sure your learnings from this journey would be very very helpful uh, for our audience, many of who are either building the marketplace or are planning to build a marketplace. So uh, thank you once again and uh, let's dive in. Thank you, thank you for having me. So I would uh, love to go back to when you started and a lot of people who are thinking of starting up have this question that if there is an idea, then we will leave the job. And some people say, yeah, I have to do it, let me quit and uh, I'll then figure out the idea. So which of the two boards were you in and, and then how did you zero in on, on the idea? So I was in the second board, which is let's <coughs> quit and uh, then hopefully an idea will come. And that is because uh, for two years I was in the first board and there was no idea coming and eventually I realized that I am working 14 hours a day for someone else and the paycheck is hitting the bank account every month. So the day I think about ideas for 14 hours a day and there is no paycheck hitting the bank account, the idea will come. So I called up Varun and I said, yeah, we are making no... So we used to have these weekend conversations, PA because of tempo because of this is back in the day, 2011, 2012. But we were really making no progress beyond an Excel sheet. So eventually I gave up and I said, so I'm quitting and then he also quickly made up his mind that he is quitting and uh, actually when we made that decision we, ha we had no idea what we wanted to do uh, but we just vaguely knew that we were trying to do something uh, related to technology at that level and, and from there to sort of finalizing the other company idea what was that journey like I know you were in consulting earlier so was there like an excel sheet with different Sort of criteria you were rating them on to finally zero in on, on this? So, very interestingly, we had worked on an idea before Gartuna. It was called Cinema Box. And uh, we chanced upon the idea. The two of us were going uh, for a friend's wedding and uh, there was no network. We were taking a train to Jaipur, there was no network in the middle back then. And Varun you know, randomly said, yeah, how cool would it be if we could install a uh, you know, device in this train which could create a local loop and deliver content. Um, and almost having sort of this uh, you know, uh, negativity associated with consulting and doing all the market sizing and all, we said, hey, this, is, this is how it's supposed to happen. The, the Eureka movement strikes you like this, this is, you know, and, and this is obviously a great space and uh, you know, so many people are traveling in buses, trains and planes every day and it's such a big need. Uh, so, uh, we did nothing, we did no market sizing, did not understand the sector. Uh, I remember we, you know, thanks to our connections, we were able to meet uh, a lot of senior people, so we ended up meeting uh, one of the board uh, members of Indian Railways, we ended up meeting the CEO of a leading airline and we pitched the whole idea to the CEO and he said, you know, this is great, uh, but what are you going to do about uh, the ban on Wi-Fi in uh, Indian skies? And the two of us looked at each other because we were not aware that there was such a ban. <laughs> so we said, oh, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to you on that. But that was the level of naivety with which we had entered. Uh, so basically Indian Railways was out, there was a ban in the, in the skies, we tried to sell this device to Haryana Roadways and quickly realized that Kandal buses were also out. So the market time suddenly shrunk to uh, air conditioned private buses, which started looking like an extremely small tam. On top of that you were being squeezed by the content guys on one side, the operators on the other side, you were basically you were not top priority for anybody. Uh, so, spent a few months on that idea and I think uh, wisdom prevailed and we were able to give it up before spending more time and energy. That's when we met Raghav, our third co-founder. He had also uh, started an idea in the Uber for auto rickshaw space and shut that down. Uh, so I was following Raghav throughout his journey building that company, it was called Buggy. And I was constantly telling him that look, this is not going to be a standalone category. Eventually, you know, Ola will do this. is just a you know add-on feature for them. Uh, so why don't you come and join us in Cinema Box? And his view was that Cinema Box is not a technology company; it's really a tech services kind of company, white labeling. And I think both it's easier to see the other person's faults than your own faults. So uh, his company also shut down at the time. 
then he came uh, on board and uh, now once we did twice shy we were a little bit you know now we said okay not all the skills we learned in consulting were all uh, so let's at least be a little bit more thoughtful this time around and we basically said that three things have to be met one there should be a very large dam because you know and we had a small dam in the first idea, so naturally said, let's attack a large dam. Large dam will allow you to make mistakes. Uh, two, uh, you know, technology should be at the heart of, of the idea. All three of us were and continue to be deeply passionate about technology. Uh, and three, it should have it should be good for you know society. It should like if we are successful and we are selling more of whatever we are selling. It should have a positive impact on society at large, so that we feel good about you know the impact that we have. So we had this very simple criteria, and uh, we zeroed in on three ideas uh, after that funnel-based approach. Uh, this is June, July of 2014. Food delivery, grocery delivery, and home services. <laughs> so grocery, I I do Azad Pur Monday one morning, and I said. I, I I am not doing this. <laughs> I told the girl that this is not happening. Boss. I just can't relate to it. And for the life of me, in 2014, I could not see how people will buy groceries online. So yeah, that's that's how fast we all change. So I just said, I, I told Varun and Agarwal, are you crazy? Who is ever going to buy groceries online? Food. We were we were late for the party, and we were showing up for the party after midnight. The, the bus had already sailed, and. Uh, so services, as in all three of us had some inclination towards it. So we said, let's spend some more time in the market. Consumers, we we started to immediately, you know, the pain point was very, very relevant to consumers. We, we floated a random Facebook group where we said that if you want any service professional, we'll come back to you with one recommendation in 24 hours. And in three weeks, that group organically reached about eight, 900 uh, people with a, without like a single dime of money being spent. Uh, I think this group still exists. The name of the group was Fine Trusted Professionals in Delhi and so We did not even apply too much thought to how to name it. Uh, but then when we started spending time on the supply side, I think that's what gave us the final uh, push because we realized that it wasn't because of lack of uh, lack of intent that the market was broken. It was because of the underlying structure of the market lack of opportunity, lack of the right incentives, uh, and lack of technology. And that we felt that, okay, this is solvable. And we also felt very strongly that this, that somebody is going to build this out. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years out, there is going to be a very, very large category defining company that will create this category, will take it online, will improve experience for customers, improve the lives of service professionals. That seemed inevitable to us. That you know somebody's going to do it, um, and that was about it. Then we jumped in. So it's interesting. The first thing you said is TAM, and uh, what I have realized is in cases where TAM is very obvious, and I would say probably grocery is one of them, they get so crowded. Uh, it's very very hard to differentiate. So cases where TAM is obvious to the founder lot more than it's obvious to the rest of the world mm -hmm. and those are the most beautiful categories and I remember you said in our podcast every round that you raised it wasn't it clear to investors who are evaluating what the time is even though you were thinking so what gave you that conviction that it is actually a large market and why did investors sort of get it round after round or most few did so obviously no no, no <laughs> most did not uh, even some who came into our cap table was still questioning the <laughs> damn the company is I see I was always surprised with that we kept getting asked that question. Why we still get asked that question? You know, everybody asks us that question because everybody who's coming at whichever round they're coming at wants to see a 5x, 10x from there. So there'll always be that question of damn. But I think I think there's a there's a second order aspect to this, which is you know the TAM. One is an obvious stand, which is, as you are saying, grossly, it's, it's large, it's already happening. The second is that there is a need, but it is underserved. So there's almost like a latent tag, so to speak. Right? And uh, for example, if you would have sized how many people are ordering food from restaurants 
in 2014, that time would not have appeared to be very large. But if you almost think about it as people eating food, you know, then suddenly that time appears to be much larger. Uh, so I think in our case, for a lot of our services, it was just really, really hard for people to get the right services. And as a result, they were only getting it when they really needed to get it. I mean, nobody was really getting you know, professional cleaning done in their house or getting spa done or even beauty, etc. Like, it was, it was a relative or AC service. AC service, I mean, there was no category called AC servicing before. You, know, you see, properly built it up, right? People were honestly not even getting their AC service. So, in a lot of the cases, the TAM is it's there, it's at the surface, but below the surface, you have to look at you know, whether there is a true unmet underlying need uh, which, which you can unlock. Uh, and I think those become very interesting, uh, interesting plays uh, because. As a founder, you're just seeing it differently from everybody else. Yeah, no, completely agree. And also, the way like you put it as latent need or latent market, the way we look at it, which is just a different perspective, is size of market and severity of pain point. Mm. So sometimes the market is very large, like grocery, but there is no severity. The Kirana is next door. Mm. Versus in this case, far at home, market is tiny because there is no or food delivery, the experience was so broken. Uh, and sometimes the latter is much more important and if you solve it well, you can like you see as then you can really expand the market Absolutely. over the years. Yeah. So now from sort of finalizing the idea to then saying okay now we should get started and it was a two-sided marketplace from day one and I remember you started with a different approach, iterated, ended up at a different approach. So we would love to hear that journey. Uh, what was the original uh, thesis? What led to some of those iterations? Yeah, so the original thesis was again, you know, embedded in naivety. So we approached the market saying that technology is enough and we will build a curated technology marketplace where you can come for pretty much any service need and um, you know, we'll connect you to vetted and verified professionals who are willing to serve you. Uh, and we felt that this could be, you know, this market problem could be solved using largely technology. Uh, so that's the view with which we launched in November of 2014. Uh, it was very crowded, as Google has already alluded to, and I think Interaction had come out with a report saying that 300 companies in local services or something like that. So it was extremely crowded, you know. We were all undifferentiated. Everybody was doing pretty much the same thing with some tweaks in the category mix, etc. Uh, but basically nobody had found what is known as product market fit. Uh, through 2015, we, 2015 was, you know, one of those crazy years in the Indian internet, just like 2021 was. So we were able to raise multiple rounds of of funding, seed, series A, series B, all in a span of 10 months. And even before our first anniversary, we had raised $36 million of capital. We were valued at about $100 million, uh, zero revenue, no product market fit. Uh, 350 people loitering around in the company. Uh, and, um, you know, honestly, like, the consumer experience was very, very broken. So, in fact, remember, uh, this was not elevation, but yeah, I spoke to a couple of our board members and I said that, you know, I feel like we don't have product market fit. Now, uh, I was told, no, no, you do, don't worry. It's <laughs> all <laughs> so good then. But, you know, at some point, you have to start looking at the truth as a founder, right? So, uh, we had a, you know, we had a discussion in the founding group and we said, look at this is not what we set out to do. We are really not solving the consumer pain point here. Supply side bucket is leaking. Uh, and and I heard somebody say that if you are asking the question whether you have product market fit or not, you probably don't. So we said, look, we are asking the question, so we probably don't have product market fit. So let's at least try and find it. And then what we did was we ring fenced a small team and we said, okay, let's pick one category and at least try to understand the nuts and bolts of that category as a service business first before building this technology. That category was sell-off services for women at home. 
the thesis was you know woman is the primary decision maker for all home services uh, uh, the busy mother uh, busy working mother is our first attack <coughs> each uh, she doesn't have time to step out to do a salon so can we send the salon home again if you looked at the market size for salon services at home in 2015 it would have been a smaller total than that what you see is currently doing in that category so theoretically we have a, 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 you know captured 100% of the that but in reality the time has grown uh, so we attacked that category and uh, you know we said okay let's do everything in this category end to end let's uh, hire the right sort of beauticians let's systematically train them uh, let's get products etc etc et over time we'll figure out how to build these capabilities and, and over time these all have become capabilities. Uh, whether it's training, whether it's uh, product procurement, financing solutions, insurances, etc. So we started that in 2016, and um, I think I should remember uh, in in Jan, uh, Ravi had joined our board. So we had this board meeting, and you know, as you know, Ravi is a man of few words. So uh, I presented this idea that we're going to go deep in salon. And uh, you know, Ravi just said, "This looks good. Let's." Uh, this was his first board meeting uh, in UC, so he said, "This looks good. Uh, let's give it a year and circle back." And for me, that was such a uh, almost a liberating, uh, you know, sentence from his mouth because we used to operate in two weeks and four weeks. So if here's a board member who's saying, "Take a year and let's figure out after that," it was liberating because. It, It told me, okay, let's go and do this properly. So we spent the next six months building that vertical, and something very magical started to happen. We, for the first time, started to see strong consumer attention and consumer cohorts which actually smile up. All uh, we had a presence in almost seventy-five to eighty categories by then, because in technology and open marketplace, very easy to scale up. However, our entire consumer brand and why consumers knew us was for the salon service category. In fact, most consumers started to think of us as a beauty app, and when they reached the app, they realized that it was what we cover each other. And on the one side, in the lead gen open marketplace, we were working really hard on sales to get service partners to come on board and convincing them that there was a leaky churn. And on the other side, here. Every day we had beautician showing up at our office organically. They are figuring out where the office address is and coming and saying, "I want to join this platform." They have heard that I can make forty thousand, fifty thousand rupees a month. So, middle of twenty sixteen is when again we sat down as a team and we said, "Okay, this is what product market fit actually looks like and feels like." And then we went to an ex- to an excruciating journey of. Of shutting the open marketplace and pivoting over the next one and a half years, which I which I can talk about, but this was basically sort of our. Uh, it took us a while, you know, to to get to that that PNF. We were it wasn't sort of off the bat. Again, going back to that time, I remember when you were going through this pivot or iteration, other companies started believing that UC was doing something which is not scalable. And it's funny because over the years, this phrase that do things which don't scale. When you are starting a marketplace, it has become like common knowledge. At that time, it was not, but that's literally what uh, you were doing. And and again, one of our learnings on this has been that in early days, your scale or GMV doesn't really matter, and which is what that tech platform was giving you. But it's more minimal, uh, minimum viable happiness. That yeah. are you really making your suppliers, customers significantly? More happier or not? Which I guess once we decided to focus on one category, that started to happen. So, so the next uh, thing I would love to spend time on is once you have decided beauty as home, uh, beauty at home as the category, and uh, there is a supply side to it, there is a demand side to it. And the hardest part is getting these two-sided marketplaces off the ground. So, I would even want to get a little tactical here. So, what exactly did you have to do? Did you pay entries? Did you Uh, sort of get some of these full-time beauticians. Did you start with just one city? How did you think about subsidies? Now, some people say it's necessary to give subsidy either on demand or supply side, and some say that no, no. If you are giving subsidies, then uh, you are really running on paper. So, how did you think about all of these to get that line going? So, we started in a very 
So when we started the salons category in a full stack fashion, we decided to do everything very differently from what we were doing for the past one year. So we picked up a very localized market, only Gurgaon. In fact, I don't even think we started with the whole of Gurgaon. I think we started with maybe half or a third of Gurgaon. Uh, a small set of partners, we gave minimum guarantees. We had to. Uh, and a lot of the early customer onboarding for that category, I remember, uh, was done actually physically. So we were around in Buddha, and you would have probably seen us at one point or the other in one of the apartments doing something. You know, there is a Karwa Chaut and we are doing something in some apartment and there's something else. And so we do all these pop-ups to really get the consumer to sort of feel firsthand what the service experience might look like and then convincing them to uh, take it at home. We were also augmenting that with, uh, with a little bit of digital. But digital had not become a very large channel because the audience on the digital platform was still limited at that point in time. So we were doing a lot of this on ground hustle. Um, and I, I used to actually participate in a lot of these myself. Uh, and it's quite humbling, you know, to, to, to actually physically go and recruit customers. It's, it's one thing to so run a digital campaign very you know, guarded in the air conditioned room, but when you're physically there, I in fact remember in one of it happened to pop up in the area market that we had set up and I ended up uh, interacting with one of the customer's husbands and he ended up being like a IIT uh, Kanpur uh, senior of mine from multiple years back. And by that time nobody had really known about Urban Clap. So he's, he said, so, so what are you doing? So I said, this is company, this is provide services. Uh, so he said, okay, how do you get your customers? So I said, like this. And he just looked at me and said, he almost, you know, to say, yeah, you like an IIT graduate and you know, this is what you're doing like with your life, like, you know, yeah, market, you're recruiting customers. But, you know, so, so, some of those things are very telling also, because you can actually, the customers are directly asking you questions. So you get to know what are their barriers. Uh, then and there. So it was the unintended consequence of that was that it actually helped us uh, in the in the development of that category. Uh, for example, they would ask us what products will you use and we were like okay, let's figure that out and so on and so forth. Um, so that was actually a good experience. Uh, that got the flywheel going. Once you, know, you get that initial flywheel going, I, I think things become a little bit more easier and, and then you can uh, Augment it with, with marketing efforts. Eventually, word of mouth has to kick in. Uh, you know, if you don't have the vast majority of your customers getting recruited through word of mouth, then you haven't really built a marketplace. Uh, it's only a marketplace when the supply and the demand, both new user recruiting, flips uh, to organic and word of mouth, which is you know, I would say the minimum barrier is fifty percent. Otherwise, you're running a marketing arbitrage uh, platform and you'll never really truly scale and, and see those profit pools getting in. Uh, you know, you can do better marketing on Google and Facebook than a small SMB and then you know sell leads to them for cheap and, and make a cut in the middle. That's not a marketplace. Uh, so you have to see that organic new user acquisition and new supply acquisition eventually crossing 50%. Ideally I would say on the supply side it should be 100% and you know, the consumer share should be 60-70%. Uh, so that started to very quickly actually happen for the salon category, uh, which gave us the confidence that uh, that this has PMF and this model has PMF. Got it. And uh, I do want to spend some more time on those early days, given a lot of audience are still in that scene, series A, a lot of phases of their journey. So you mentioned you raised three rounds back to back within 12 months. Obviously that was a different market. Today we are in a different market, but still, and you, I'm sure, advised founders over the years. So what would your advice be to folks who are building a marketplace or even building any other startup in fundraising, especially in this kind of environment? Um, see, we raised those rounds, but thankfully we didn't spend it. So we actually had, because we realized that we don't have product market fit and uh, you know, spending a lot of money before you have product market fit and trying to scale or something is, and we briefly did it and I can tell you that it, it can 
it can be a nightmare and it can lead to uh, very bad consequences. So, uh, one is regardless of whether you raise a lot of capital or limited capital or no capital, you shouldn't get into the scale up mode unless you are confident that you have a product or a service that the market is pulling. Uh, and, and the market is pulling it, you are not pushing it. Uh, so, there are more customers that you can serve, there are more suppliers who are joining, and then you have space, and you're basically cramping to you know, just meet the, the demand. And we did not have that in the first version of our product, but we certainly had that in Salon. Uh, as far as fundraising is concerned, the only advice I would give is that raise, I think fundraising and, and this is sort of, you know, if I just zoom out and look at the 8-9 years of building, you see, uh, I think one of the things that has served us well is that we've seen fundraising as loosely correlated with the journey of the company and the needs of the company and not a very, very tight couple. And what I mean by that is, I've always raised when I can and the market is, uh, uh, you know, right to raise and many founders raise for 18 to 24 months. I always have the view that I should raise the next round when I have only 18 months or 24 months of runway left. So with every day actually my runway has gone from 18 to 24 months to you know, maybe like 4 5 years. So I've actually at no point in the UC journey have I let the runway fall below 18 to 24 months. And that's counterintuitive because one can argue that you know you'll be more diluted uh, etc etc but it served as well. Uh, there's, if you think about it, there's only one additional amount of dilution. Uh, but it helps you sleep well at night, it helps you take bold decisions when you have to. When COVID hits, you're not scampering uh, to survive the next 18 months because you have only 18 months of cash. When this kind of a market environment hits, uh, etc. Et so I think one of the things I've seen is founders try to very tightly couple the two and say, okay, when I get to this milestone and then when I have, that's when I'll go and raise. Um, and it's hard because you know what is not in your control is the external environment. It's like it's like a, you know, all of us have to deal with it. None of us can control it. Uh, so you're better off trying to slightly play it safe uh, as far as the fundraising is concerned. So raise when you can, basically, rather than when you need to. And I would argue that additional round of dilution, the extra dilution actually gets offset by the better terms you get across now because you are raising from a position of strength versus from a position of weakness. Yeah. This position of strength I have seen very clearly and I think there you, your approach of fundraising is unique. Most founders would raise for 18-24 months versus you raising when you have that runway and I have seen how that has enabled you to raise from a position of strength every time. One more thing I really admired about uh, you see from early days is the quality of team that you built and, and again it's very obvious that if you have an A plus team, the risk of pace and quality of execution is very different. Every founder thinks they are building an A plus team, no founder thinks they are hiring B plus players. So, there, what was your approach early days? What were the kind of people you hired? Where were you hiring them from? And again, some learnings from that time, what were, what did not work? So, uh, you are absolutely right. Like, Literally from the get-go, we decided that we are going to hire the, the very best people. Um, and it's not like we will wait to get to a certain scale to earn the right to hire a certain type of talent. We said that, you know, we have to be surrounded by great talent right from the get-go. Uh, it's obviously very hard to convince such uh, talented folks to join you. Uh, you don't have much money, so most of our initial team was taking I remember our first two weeks, both of them took 60% uh, pay cuts, 60%. And of course, we paid them very richly in ESOPs, which have now ended up uh, you know, uh, serving them well. But back then, uh, you, know, you have to convince them. Um, and the right people get convinced. You, know, you have to sell your vision, the right people get convinced. They see, as soon as you have that initial critical mass, which is the hardest to get, the first two, three people, once, you know, the thing about great talent is once they see people inside the company who are like them, then more come, uh, you know, as bad um, Our barometer for great people was, 
and this could be slightly controversial, but uh, we used to use two yardsticks. We used to use prior pedigree as a mark of uh, filtration. And uh, my view there is that um, if you've done well in life in the past, it's a good indicator that you will continue to do well in life in the future. We've also had people who don't come from a pedigree background, but in the leadership team initially, we took that call that less, so basically the typical consulting firms of McKinsey, BCG, we had a lot of folks from, from that background join us. And second, we used to do extreme reference checks. Extreme reference checks. And you know, referencing is also very interesting because most people will give you good answers that oh, he's a great person, you know. It's, it's very hard to discern. Uh, but we would, we would try to get to the next level. Uh, in, for example, one of my favorite questions in reference check is, is this person in the top 1% of people you work with, top 5%, top 10%, top 20%, top 50% or top, uh, you know, whatever. And uh, it, it's interesting, a lot of people say top 10%. And one would assume top 10% is great. But for me, it's a way to tell them that he's actually two levels below the best person that you work with. One top 1%, top 5%, and then top 10%. So he's actually kind of two levels below. So you have to you know, really dig these things out. Otherwise, you know, people love to give, particularly in India, very glowing references. Um, so we index a lot of reference shares, uh, and we still do. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that worked, uh, worked well for us. And once you again have that flighty, you know, then more people will, will come and join. Coming to the sort of core topic, of this fireside chat, what's next for marketplaces? I mean, these days the common narrative seems to be that consumer tech is done or marketplaces are done, whatever sort of uh, big markets or categories existed have been taken. So, what's your view there? Any themes you think are exciting if, if you are advising the young founders, you would ask them to pursue or any framework or approach to think about where to start up? Honestly, I'm not uh, an expert at this, uh, and this was the question uh, when Mukul and Sainthi, I said, okay, this, I have to really think about this question. Uh, and, I, and I think there was a precursor, the answers were given before the before this talk started. Was, I was looking at them and I said, okay, these are actually good answers. <laughs> but let me, uh, maybe I'll start with like a framework. So, <clears throat> I would say as a starting point, we can have the assumption that something is solved, but uh, it may not be solved. Uh, so, uh, Shiv is sitting here in the audience, he's worked in a company for a while and before that he was at Dropbox and in fact most spaces when you start, including when we started a company, it almost felt like there are so many people who are already doing this for many years, right? So, uh, Drew, the founder of Dropbox, had this very famous quote when he started Dropbox. There were many like there were many people who had already started similar solutions, and one of his friends asked him that, you know, aren't there like these five apps already for what you're doing? And he said something very, which is very deep. I think he said, yes, but which one do you use? Uh, and I think you almost have to ask this question. Whenever you're looking at a category and you feel the category is solved, which one do you use? Right? We assume a lot of categories are solved, but often they are actually not solved. Uh, so I think that's that's one important element of the framework. Uh, TAM slash latent TAM remains. I think you you have to uh, you have to sort of uh, you don't want to get into something that is you neither call the TAM or the latent TAM. Large TAMs, large latent TAMs will give you the elbow to make mistakes. The third, I think, is there has to be, you know, some consumer insight slash pain point that you recognize, which gives you the conviction that around this I can build an early wedge to attack this market. Um, something that, you know, sticks out as a sore thumb. Uh, or, or gives you that confidence that okay, this piece uh, can be can be sort of my early wedge uh, into the market. 
uh, and and often with that early wedge, the the market size and the time might not look very large, uh, but but it can give you the inroads into what is a much larger time uh, over time. So I think with that context, if I was to think about uh, you know marketplaces, for example, if you ask me, uh, I actually think grocery does work. You know, uh, and I think the pain point is also fairly large today. Now, a lot of us might think, no, oh, grocery store, five people are doing it, they're doing it in 10 minutes, etc., etc. But actually, getting high quality produce, you know, which you can rely upon at your, at your home, at least I will go offer a solution that's doing it. There's some answers in meat, uh, with licious, etc. They're doing a fairly good job, but I think grocery is fairly unsolved. Um, Before you go to the second idea, so you came in when I think Manish was on the last slide. The first slide was this high end or high quality grocery. Yeah, oh, okay, great. <laughs> so groceries are sold. Um, <clears throat> one, I know for a fact that while a lot of a lot of market uh, places have emerged for either. <laughs> Tier 4 and for tier 5 kind of India. Actually, the largest part of India lives in villages, uh, which is sort of what we call rural, rural, rural right? There's no tier. Uh, and the differentiation is basically uh, you know, is there a like, municipality or like a gram panchayat? And actually, e commerce for villages is completely also. We assume that e-commerce for villages is solved, but actually it's like a completely unsolved problem. Uh, and there, there are companies taking the crack. There's one called Rosanna that's doing reasonably well. Uh, but you know that just appears to be a very very large problem which nobody has made. And to the point where actually I think people are traveling like kilometers to buy basic things that they need, for, you know, including groceries, etc outside of what they, they produce. So so that definitely seems, you know, so broader gross like grocery e-com might seem to be categories which are like completely made. Uh, but but I, I don't necessarily think they are. Um, I, I love the idea around speedy for homes. I think that's definitely something that especially in India with, there's so much opacity in the home buying experience, uh, I think that's definitely something that uh, can take off. Uh, I've always wondered about, you know, uh, and it's, uh, it's a very, it's a space that doesn't appear to be uh, at the surface very large, but you know, a lot of us spend a lot of money for our kids' extra vehicle activities. And I've always wondered why, and people have taken a crack at it. I think mean, you guys have tried to find a couple of places. But somehow the category defining company has not emerged there. So I feel like that's also something that's nice for disruption. Jobs. Again, I, you know, uh, Nokri is like a great, uh, Info is a great company, Nokri is a great product. But, uh, it just seems like a very, very web 1.2 experience in this day and age. So, and it's definitely a large category. Uh, I know there are new age versions of it, uh, which are taken as this tablet in space like software. Uh, Mesa is a good, good sort of new uh, attack, uh, uh, new way of attacking on the side of educational uh, vector good. But I, I feel like jobs is, like, should see some disruption. Uh, yeah, look, I would almost say that don't assume that there is no category that is not disruptive. You know, uh, that's been one of my learnings in the consumer tech. Like, you go through cycles of 10 15 years, and you know, there's a change in the underlying technology, and then everything is up for disruption. Uh, or there's a change in consumer behavior and then ending up for disruption. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think if you apply yourself, you know, pretty much any category is, is disruptive. Very, very interesting. 
set of ideas and I do want to really emphasize on the first point you said where sometimes it feels the market is taken, especially if you are asking for VCs, but don't ask the VCs, ask the consumer whether their need is really solved or not. And if I go back in time, uh, in 2018, late 2018, we invested in spinning. And at that time, if you had asked the VCs, the common wisdom was that the used car space had played out. Yeah. There were three unicorns, uh, all of them large, well funded, but if you talk to the buyer who wants to buy a used car, their problem was not solved and that's what Stevie was solving. And today, if we look at the used car retail industry or, or that market, Stevie is the clear market leader. So, so always talk to the consumers, not VCs when trying to validate whether your thesis this is actually very good to get, right? Like there will be a lot of these categories that you will assume that okay, these are already played out. But when you as a consumer eventually have to go and purchase, if you're very unlikely to go to the on furniture is a good example, right there. Like, home interior is a great example. Right, like there are large players, maybe a unicorn player, like it seems like a played out space, so much capital is going But if tomorrow you were to buy your house and you were to set up your own interior, are you likely to go to one of those players or still default to you know going with a recommendation of a friend and family member for an interior designer? Exactly the same thing you would have done 10 years back. Chances are that space has actually not played out uh, yet. Uh, so I think that's a very good way of looking at it. And, and I do want to build on sort of couple of things you touched there. One was this same continuous thinking where it feels like the market is solved but not. Cabs, if you look at again our own experience, the quality of service has gone down drastically. So can something new and interesting be done there? Similarly, you spoke about this extra curricks, but even K12, I do feel given just the disparity in quality of teacher supply. Disparity as a geographic spread and students. Should there be an online live learning platform for kids? Uh, there was so much funding which went to EdTech, everyone's chase scale. I think that problem has been left unsolved. So, can you mention extra I think even in Curricks, that problem is still unsolved. So, there is fear, yeah, you know. Yeah. Cabs is right up there, uh, K12 is right up there. Um, she was like, this is being recorded, is it? <laughs> I have to be careful with what I say. Vacation rentals is very unsolved in India. Uh, you know, so uh, there are a lot of spaces where you know, we might assume that the story has already played out, uh, but it likely uh, likely has not yet. Uh, pets will great problem, I think. Uh, I think especially the next generation, uh, you know, marriages are getting pushed out, people are either have fewer or no kids, most of us I think at some point or the other might get a pet. So that feels like a category, perhaps it's still early, still three to four years earlier, early than you know, the absolute right time, but maybe a player today will have that head start uh, to, to play it out. You don't want to be too early also, because then by the time the market is right, you already lost all the steam. Uh, so that also happens uh, in, in many of these categories. Yeah. I know you have a hard stop in another 10-15 minutes, so we'll probably open up uh, for a few questions from the audience. You can raise your hand and uh, Mike will come to you. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hi, Vilaj. So you have done a lot of work in state development and uh, the categories that you are in, it's, it's not like an extremely hard skill to learn, but at the same time it does require dedication. Now the problem that that I want to get your point of view on is that the person who is getting trained, like he did not go to one of the best colleges. So, but at the same time you want to get that person to a certain level of professionalism. And I think that is a huge problem for India as a country. That it is how How do we make sure that people get skilled and become professional and because there is demand. If not, eventually are But the problem is on the supply side constantly. Because these are human beings and human beings which need to first time believe that there is a professional party at your level. You are not somebody who is going to hold up their payment as a salary or make deductions, you know, which, which you did not tell them of that. So how do you solve that trust problem at scale? Because you truly are one of those companies who have done it at scale, um, unlike a regular tech play. So that is what I want to get you for scale. So in my experience, I think what I found is that actually most people, like India is very aspirational uh, 
young uh, population and actually there is no lack of intent. So uh, people want opportunities, they are willing to work hard by and large and they are willing to learn. Um, you need to create the infrastructure and capabilities to enable and empower them. Uh, so for example, you are right that you know there is no proper formal training programs which can produce high quality plumbers, beauticians, carpenters, cleaners, etc. in the country. We have to invest and build that. Today we have more than 250 training centers in the country. We have an in-house team of 300 trainers. In each of these trades, we figured out what does it take to skill an AC technician from scratch. So that even if a fresher walks into my training program, how do I transform him or her into a high quality AC technician or a high quality beautician or masseuse. Uh, but once we figured it out, you know, we found that people are willing to join, right? People may not have a bank account, they may not have access to loans, but you can provide these things. Um, so, I would actually say that the lack of professionalism is not, it's not inherent to the people as such, it's because of the lack of opportunities and solving, which entrepreneurs like you and me have to do. Uh, the audience is actually ready, the population is ready, they are hungry, earn more, they want good jobs, they are very aspirational, uh, they don't just settle. So if an urban company uh, service professional was making 15,000 earlier and now they make 30,000, it's not that that's, they're just happy. The question we get asked is, okay, how do I make 40, how do I make 50? Uh, what is my career progression from here on? Uh, and we've made that career progression, which eventually leads them to become a trainer, a senior trainer, etc. Most of our training fleet comes from our own service professionals. Um, you become eventually become a vice president of the company starting off as a service professional on the platform, right? Uh, so, I think it's an aspirational uh, young middle class that we have. We just need to provide them the right sort of opportunities to, to enable them. Right, I remember I sent this guy who came to my place and he told me that you were sending him to Saudi. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, right. we'll do that. We were very happy about it. Thank you. Hi Viraj, I'm uh, so my name is Tobias Bhatt, I'm the founder of Peter. So you talked about two boards, right? One board where you are looking for an idea, you're working somewhere. The another board where you quit and you start looking for the idea. Totally agree, but I believe there is a third board where most of the founders are, I believe, I believe coming around these days. The third board is where you found the idea. You know this is the market where I want to create something, I want to discuss this market. If it's a tech enabled product or market, you have to pay for the server, you have to pay for the developers, you have to pay for the quality sure, you have to pay for a lot. So that third board where you you have to fund, you have to invest from your pocket and that runway can be for only for six months if you quit your job. Right? Because it's a tech enabled and you want to be big in that market. So do you think that both how we can run that board for a longer time if we don't look for funding, we want to make it bootstrap, but most of the VCs, most of the people ask, you are not fully in, but people are fully in because they are working for let's say 8 hours for different company, but again they are spending 8 hours or 10 hours on the left out of 16 hours on their product because they have to pay for the other people who they have hired for their, uh, so how do you solve that? See yeah. If I was to at least articulate the two boards I was in, which I think most entrepreneurs are. One is the board where you have not found the courage, and the second is the board where you have found the courage. That is the real level. When most of us are still on the fence and not taking the leap, it is because we have not found the courage. And we will make a lot of, you know, the nature of us as human beings, we will make a lot of excuses and learn to lie to ourselves as to why we are not taking that leap. We are not taking that leap because the timing is not right, because we don't have the right idea, the performance has not come together, uh, you know, I need to still fund it this way, that way. Bootstrap companies exist forever, right? So, you have to realize that when you take that leap, you will never have all the pieces of the puzzle that fit. You probably won't even have half the pieces of the puzzle that fit. Yeah? You will have very, very few. And that is why it will always be a risk. Um, and that is why very few take it. And that is why the risk reward equation is treated and very, very toxic. Uh, somebody may join you on the first day 
and work as hard as you for the next 10 years. And that person might only have 1 or 2% of the company and you have 30% of the company. Why does the ecosystem disproportionately reward you? Because you took that risk. Uh, so, I think if at all there are two boards, it's that one is the board where you found the courage. Until you have you're the other board. You're looking for that courage. Go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, during the early uh, days of uh, Urban Computer, Urban... Both the sides, and it's still a work in progress. And every year we still have this debate and, you know... In fact, on multiple occasions, one of our investors, I would name them, said, you know, why don't you just put it out there on the app that this intermediation is not allowed. You will not see it on the app anywhere, by the way, right? Like, you don't go outside the platform and things like that. Uh, but it's just been a principled approach that we have taken. And that's forced us to constantly create new and new value levers. Um, and over time it has come down. Right? So we are able to measure it very, very accurately. Uh, there is enough for it six and, and enough technology to measure whenever it happens. And we've seen that number has always come down. And as a consumer also, in the early days, you know, you would have probably nine out of ten service professionals you would ask for the number, they would say, yes, please call me. And now maybe 5 out of 10 will say that or even fewer and many of them will say no just book me through the platform. Uh, and that's because you know they are seeing that value of going through the platform every time. Got it, thanks. So, um, hi I'm Abul, hi Adirat, I'm Devashi, founder of Odoka. So we have seen a lot of e-commerce players with the vertical of our But we have never seen a very custom solution for India that is more hybrid, right? If you order something to, to Nine Club today, you will get it within 2 days or 3 days or 4 days. When you next door, a cosmetics seller must be having it in store and deliver it in one night. So we have not seen any hybrid model of commerce in India where a person can search something online but get it bought locally and we are not connecting any seller. So in e-commerce like Amazon, we have seen that electronics are mainly bought after touch and feel of the product, right? It cannot be bought digitally entirely but again a buyer has a lot of challenges in finding the right merchant who has the product with you. Ten years back, as a user, we only knew that which category of the product we wanted to buy, but now we know which product to buy or which category. And discovering that product in a hyper local space is still very challenging for the buyer. So, what's your take about hybrid commerce that is most suited in India because retail dominates the common countries area? You want to take a quick crack at that? See, I can show you a couple of reasons why historically it's not been solved. But again, as I said, don't listen to VCs, go ahead and talk to consumers. Uh, one is, if you look at offline channel, uh, visibility of what they have in stores is very poor and therefore can you reliably even figure out, for example, if you took someone looking for a certain beauty product, which store is sitting in its very hard. Second, by the time a product reaches a retailer, a lot of value in that value chain has already been uh, taken out either by distributor, wholesaler, that guy is paying his rent, salary, etc. So, a lot of cost has already been added in the supply chain. So, therefore, from there, so even grocery, you would have seen so many people first tried in that initial era, go first, pepper time, pick up from store, deliver to customer, and go because all the value has already gone out of the supply chain. But are there categories where this can work? Maybe if, if both of these problems can be solved, but it, that's been a challenge story. In US, Instacart did really well. They are now going IPO, but their consumers pay so much for convenience that they aren't taking it from retailers' pocket. It's consumers and brands. In India, again, that behavior is starting to emerge, but still very early. So, well, uh, we are basically electronics, and we have seen that electronics cash for online players are more than a local retailer. But they have a smaller um, uh, size to put your inventory, and they're moving very fast. But the challenge for the buyer is, they want to discover a product online, but they want also want to have a touch and feel. So you buy something from Amazon, get it again, return back, get it back again. So that's a challenging stuff. Off. Let's talk afterwards. Actually. I think we can take one last question. I'm sorry, I know there are a lot of questions, but just one last question. Uh, hi, Mukul. Hi, Raj. Hi. So, uh, as you see, there is a super app for a lot of industries, like the salon industry, the car washing industry, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, you have a pretty very good sense of this, you have a you were building a networking platform where actually learners and educators come in and you are trying to create a, you know, where all the education is located on the platform. 
and uh, we got this uh, uh, interesting question from both the investors and doctors that you are trying to cater to a lot of industries at one, right? So, what was your solution? Or what was your answer? Or what? Was, I mean, I, I guess you would also have got these questions from the people or stakeholders you talked to. So, how did you actually solve this, tackle this, or answer this? I think it's actually a fairly difficult challenge, I must tell you. Actually solving it. Forget the question that VCs will ask, that you can answer. But the real challenge is to actually solve these verticals individually. Uh, together they might appear to be home services, which is a vertical you know, commerce uh, category. But the reality is that beauty is very different from even massage is very different from doing a gentleman's haircut at home. It's very different from AC. So we've had to go deep in each of these verticals. And a problem that we've always struggled with is what to platformize and where we have to really go deep and be willing to build individual capabilities. And whenever we've struggled with it, we just throw it in the towel and say, hey, let's just go and build these individual capabilities and worry about platformizing later. Because unless we do, we are never going to be able to compete and you know, last thing we want is tomorrow some vertical specialist beauty player come and say that do it better than you or whatever, right? some painting player come and say. Uh, and that's happening also. Uh, so we have been fairly paranoid to say let's let's go as deep as we can. But it's, all, it's always challenging and therefore we always have struggled with you know, depth versus scope. Like literally today I had a discussion with my CBO where he said you know, we are too spread out, we need to cut back more and we need to go deeper in, in a few areas, we have just too much going on. Um, so this will become a challenge for you. If you are, if you are spread out, uh, it, it, it does become a real challenge. Also, do remember the sequencing, like Abhinath said early days it was only duty at home yeah, or that's only good now. Yeah. So you can't go too go well, on, on day one, that we tried and it was an epic failure. So. <laughs> Even if you want to build a horizontal, you have to start with some vertical something. It's like vertical to vertical. Absolutely. At the minimum. At the minimum. Yeah, yeah. vertical to vertical. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Abhiraj, I know a lot more questions, but uh, you have a personal commitment. Thank you so much once again for uh, taking time out. Your learnings and insights were very valuable for me, I'm sure, for the audience as well. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks.